Friends, welcome to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It's not difficult for you, but it's nice for me, and we're starting. My name is Dana. I think anyone would say that I'm pretty attractive. Of course, I'm not an enthusiastic beauty, but I can always control myself at parties. I have a slim build, weighing almost 57 kilograms with a height of 165 centimeters. Her breasts are small but firm, and her stomach is as flat as it was at the age of 18. This is the result of my gym workouts three times a week for the last decade. I remember the day my husband Dan bought a Corvette. He was so proud of it, polishing it and polishing it. He always had a soft cotton cloth in his hands. When he was next to him, he constantly wiped it. I went with him a few times, but he wouldn't let me drive. Too much power? It's easy to get lost, he told me, expertly steering the car. It was true, but Dan drove very well, so I wasn't worried. I remember a knock on the door. I was just putting fresh pastries in the oven to bake. Dan was supposed to be back soon. He loved my homemade cakes. I switched him to low-calorie sugar, realizing that Dan had a small spare tire in the middle. I hoped he wouldn't notice the difference. I was still holding my mittens in my hands when I opened the door. Two policemen were standing there, and my world collapsed around me. It took almost a whole year before I was allowed to bring Dan home. His crushed body was strapped to a wheelchair. He used only his left arm. He handled the remote quite deftly. His hand was strapped to the armrest so that his fingers could hold the buttons freely. He couldn't speak or turn his head. I took care of his bodily functions and constantly monitored his body temperature. But inside, it was my Dan, the man I loved. He used his still working fingers to try to write, painstakingly putting words together on the screen he was sitting in front of. The idea was to sell some of his work to help our rapidly fading finances. Everything was not going well. Reading some of Dan's work, I felt that he was several different people. Sometimes he wrote as a woman, sometimes as a man. Several different men, several different women. The words came out of him in chunks, parts of reality and fantasy strangely mixed. I realized that the world he was living in now was almost all inside him. Then I started the process of putting all this crazy patchwork quilt from his works in a certain order that would make sense. There was a book, a story, if I could sell it. As the days passed, our lives slowly went downhill. There was insurance. I remember Dan talking about it the day we signed the policy. No matter what happens, we'll be fine, he told me, hugging me. It has always been difficult for me to pay insurance premiums. Several times I thought it was a waste of money which we needed so much. But now, it wasn't enough. I realized that nothing is ever enough. Most of the medical expenses were covered, but what about life and everyday life? 90% of all medical expenses? Read one paragraph. It sounded great, except for the first $10,000 we paid a deduction to make the policy affordable. In addition, his accounts exceeded a million dollars. And they grew. In just two short years, I've been behind on my house payments. Our tiny savings account that we topped up with $100 every month to last until retirement? It's been over for a long time. I even sold our new minivan and bought an old Dodge. State disability is a benefit, it helped, but nothing more. I couldn't work full-time, and Dan needed constant care to maintain his body temperature and take care of his other needs. It was possible to leave for a few hours, but no more. Of course, I tried to hire someone to help, but my secretarial skills limited my potential income. The nurse cost more than I could earn. Plus, try to get a job somewhere with a disabled husband. Hoping for company insurance? Well, yes, of course it will work. Now the bank wanted to take our house. The nice man who came to talk to me was very sorry, but then he looked me up and down with a grin and said that we can think of something. I understood what he meant. Eventually, it came to this. We were $2,000 behind schedule every month. I went back to caring for Dan. There was nothing to do but wait. I wasn't sure if anyone would be interested in a 32-year-old housewife at all, but I didn't have to wait long. When I opened my email, I saw a dozen replies. Several of them were downright rude. Only one seemed normal to me. He introduced himself as Carl, and I replied by sending a photo of myself taken on the beach in a conservative swimsuit. I received an answer almost instantly, and after several surprisingly polite letters, we set a date for a meeting in the lobby of a local hotel. 
I was scared to death when I dressed in my best black evening dress, with a dropped shoulder on one side and a slit on the sides to mid-thigh. She carefully cut her hair, powdered it, made up, and did her hair. Thinking about beautiful underwear, I realized that this was not necessary. After spending some money that we couldn't afford, I ordered a taxi I didn't want Carl to know what I was driving, partly because the car was cheap, and partly so that I couldn't be tracked to my house. My love experience so far has been limited to a few fights in the backseat of a car in high school and a few short-term romances in college. Then I met Dan, a beautiful and gentle lover. We fell in love. We were so happy. But Dan wasn't prone to wild love. We were, well, normal. Therefore, I did not know at all what to do and what to expect from the man I was going to meet. You look good, lady, the taxi driver said, dropping me off at the hotel. I didn't say anything. Gathering my courage, I entered the hall. After letting my eyes adjust, I looked around for Carl. When she didn't see him, she went to the bar and ordered a soda. It was several minutes before I saw him. He was also looking around. Noticing me, he came over. Dana? I turned around, giving him my best force smile. He was about 50 years old, tall and well-dressed. There was gray at his temples, but the smile on his face calmed me down a little. You are much more beautiful than in the photo. Thanks, I replied, trying to hide my nervousness. Shall we retire to my room? It was appropriate. I finished my soda and got up. His room was located very high. I looked around when he opened the door. It was not cheap. For some reason, it helped. Music? Of course. I found a sofa and settled down on it as the soft sounds of a female singer filled the air. He joined me on the couch and handed me an envelope. I almost made the mistake of asking what it was for, but then I realized that the $500 I asked for would be there. I didn't open it to count it. Then I realized that he was looking at me expectantly. I do not know what I expected to happen next. Small talk? Perhaps seduction? What would you like? I asked. He looked at me strangely. Could you undress for me? I hesitated. He looked at me strangely again. Have you ever done this before? No. I burst into tears. I couldn't help myself. He hugged me, waited for me to stop. He looked awkward. Look, we can just... No, I have to. She got up quickly and pulled the strap off her shoulder. I unzipped the zipper and pulled down the dress. I was naked underneath it. Carl smiled and looked down at me intently. I fought the urge to cross my arms over my chest, cover my groin with my palms. I just stood there and waited, letting him watch. He took his time. He seemed to like what he saw. I suppose you're going to make love? Yes. I knelt down in front of him, struggling again. I had only minor attempts with Dan, and I didn't know what to do at all. Reaching for the front of Carl's trousers, I managed to loosen the belt and undo the top button. Then the zipper. I reached out to each side and pulled. My movements were not graceful. He lifted his hips to help me, a funny expression on his face. Expecting a huge erection, I was surprised to find almost no signs. It's easier. Tease him. Muttering something, I continued, trying to keep my teeth at a distance. Looking up, I saw his eyelids flutter. Carl reached down and stopped me before it happened. I fought to keep my mind on Dan, on what it was for him for us? Not for me. Then all I could do was feel the sensations. My body, untouched for over a year, was on fire. I know I screamed when the first wave rolled over me, followed quickly by the second when his pelvis pressed tightly against mine. My legs spread even wider. I didn't let him anymore. I used him in return. Carl exhaled and leaned back on the couch. I jumped up and went to the bathroom, washing off everything I could. God. That's how professional I am, I thought. Returning naked to the living room, I reached for my dress. Carl was sitting there naked too and studying me while I was changing. It was unusual, he said. Thanks, I muttered. You'll master it. I guess it shows that I'm not. My voice trailed off. Yes, it was fun. Do you have a business card? I didn't have it. I found a piece of paper and wrote down my number. I have a few friends who would be interested in you, he told me. I just nodded. Not many of you girls are real. He was grinning. Good night, I told him, actually blushing as I headed for the door. On the way in the elevator, I counted the money in the envelope. Yes, $500. I put them in my purse. 
I hailed a taxi on the street. The driver looked me up and down as I got in. After giving the address, we drove out onto the road. Halfway there, I caught his eye in the mirror. Are you working? God, is it already visible? Yes. There's no point in denying it now. How much? I smiled at him. Five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. He exclaimed. Holy shit. Too rich for me, lady. Maybe we should switch to trips? I didn't answer. As we drove through the dark streets to the house, I leaned my head against the window. A tear was running down my cheek. Yes, a working girl. Even the driver could have noticed it already. My name is Dana. Never in my previous life would I have even thought about letting men make love to me for a fee, but sometimes, life presents twists. I allow men and some women to use the most intimate parts of me for their own satisfaction. Some people try to be kind and loving, wanting me to assure them of this. I quickly turn into a loving woman who idolizes them. I give them the opportunity to feel strong, desirable. Some women look down on me. I hold my head high. Is their mink coat, diamond ring, fancy dinner any different from my envelope with money? I have a need to see it that way. It helps me reason sensibly. Some men hire me to grab me and call me names, clinging to me not in passion, but in fear, even in hatred. I become obedient. I do what they tell me. I was called a cheater, a fool. These words are meant to belittle me, to allow someone to feel better than me in their own world. I just let them use me, be in charge. But are they really better? They're all doing the same thing I'm doing. The difference is that they have to pay me to do it at all. To tell you the truth, I think I'm probably a better person than the men and women who use me. Most would use me if I let them, but most can't until they pay. Otherwise, they wouldn't be good enough. I have to believe in it to keep going. My husband, Dan, was terribly injured in a car accident. Confined to a wheelchair, he only moves his left arm and fingers. He doesn't talk, just touches the keys of the always-on computer in his room. It was necessary to help cope with even the most basic functions of the body. Dan is writing. He writes constantly, one laborious keystroke at a time. Many of you have read his works without knowing the true source. His whole world is inside him, and he comes out on the screen. Some of the stories were sold for pennies. Every penny helps, Dan tries. Inside these crushed remains of a once beautiful strong man, there is still the man I love, the man I swore to forever. Our life together was not magical. It was comfortable and good. Dan loved me tenderly, without perversions, without shooting stars. Only kindness and a desire to share. I was an absolutely loyal, conservative housewife, completely satisfied. Dan worked, I cooked and cleaned our little piece of the world to shine. Then a terrible accident. I could handle taking care of Dan. I could handle most of the changes in my life. But the expenses, the cost of treatment, and then just for life. Even with insurance, with minimal government assistance, we were going downhill about $2,000 every month. This sweet-sounding phrase covers 90% of all expenses over. No one ever expects 2 million medical expenses and the current $200,000 each year. Soon, almost everything was lost, and there was no sign that finances would ever improve. Dan and I both forgot about disability insurance and our home insurance. Is he dead? then the house would have been paid for. But Dan didn't die. It became our problem. There was no one, no agency that could help. Nothing at all. Just me. One day, a man from the bank came with papers. We have come to the end. If we lost the house, Dan would die. I knew that. I didn't even have the money to rent an apartment. The bank just wanted to get their money. I could understand that. It was this man who gave me the idea. He looked me up and down and suggested, we can think of something. I knew exactly what he meant, and I almost agreed, and probably would have agreed if it hadn't been for Dan, who was sitting there, helpless. The man from the bank spoke to me as if my husband were a table, a piece of furniture in the room. Dan can hear perfectly well. At first, I thought for a long time before making an announcement, I wasn't even sure I could do it. Love for a fee? Would anyone even be interested in someone like me? I knew about men. I knew about their desires from messing around in the back seat of a car, but I was completely naive about love. It helped that I had to use an online classified service, at least I could be anonymous. I set the price very high. I think it was self-defense, 
I thought that no one would ever pay that much. But I found out very quickly that yes, they will pay. A man named Carl was my first. I was lucky. He wasn't harsh or mean. He just had a need and he wanted me to satisfy it. He seemed delighted with my first amateurish attempts to please him. I'm sure I blushed at my nakedness in front of him. And I know that when I let him enter me, I took the last step. Until that very moment, I just wasn't sure I could get through it. But I did it. I let it. I did it to save Dan. There is no way back after such a step. As I said, I was lucky. Carl actually turned out to be kind. Even gentle. No matter how much I struggled with my own pleasure, my body betrayed me and took over. I had some powerful moments with Carl. I think part of it might have been due to my personal struggle not to do it. I'm not sure. Try to understand the tears, the crying inside from shame and the uncontrollable moment. My body, which had not been touched for a long time, was just reacting. I had absolutely no control over myself. I felt that I had deceived, betrayed my husband, the man I loved. $500 for a quick hour of intimacy, if that's the right term, seemed high to me. I was surprised that they were so willing to pay for it. Carl took me under his wing, so to speak. He became a kind of protector. Some would have called him a pimp, but he wasn't. He didn't take anything from me that I didn't allow. He always paid. He also had business partners, and he mentioned me to some of them. Over time, I served several of his business partners. Soon they turned into a solid blur of faces, one male erection after another. Sometimes three or four at a time. I liked several at once. I fell back into my first time shyness, and they often gave me very good tips to seduce me. Almost always, they then hired me for private sessions. One even hired me to let him use me while his wife sat and watched, and then they wanted me to watch him use his wife. Then she wanted me to. I did it. My first taste of another woman. Then I watched her husband handle a huge erection. I knew I would be well paid. Another surprise is a huge black man. I hesitated, I had never been with a black man. I've read about black men before. He was pushing me, saying, white, white, over and over again. Soon I was numb to all the scenarios, all the illegal desires that I was hired to fulfill. I was very good at reading what the client wanted. A few simple changes in demeanor and body language, and their reactions told me what to do. One man, much older than me, opened the door of his hotel room, looked me up and down. The expression on his face showed me that he was unhappy with my overly affectionate way of dressing. I took a chance. Dad, I'm sorry. Do you want me to change my clothes? He turned back to me, his eyes shining brightly, and I understood. Yes, you're a bad girl. If you walk around like that, go change your clothes. I always tried to come prepared. Different opportunities were in my back. As a result, she put on simple white cotton panties and a flared skirt and buttoned a white blouse in front. He was basically molesting me, and I was pretending to be innocent. Yes, there is a risk. I feigned surprise by saying, Oh, what is it, Dad? Strangely enough, it was fun. I saw him a few times. It was $500 each time, plus Carl paid me for taking care of his clients. Carl also invited me to his place every couple of weeks. I felt comfortable with him. Somehow, despite the fact that I was being paid, Carl became my outlet to meet the needs of my own body. Otherwise, my life has been reduced to meeting Dan's needs and making an appointment for the next meeting. The financial improvements in Dan's life and mine were happening fast. I got a bank loan and used some of the extra money to buy equipment that automatically monitored and regulated Dan's body temperature. I've set up an alarm system in case something happens while I'm out. One touch and a nurse at home can respond in a matter of minutes. These devices change my life. Now I could leave for a few hours instead of two or three. I even bought a better car, used, but at least not battered and noisy. My life has become a routine. Getting up, feeding Dan, taking care of his needs, then a shower and cleaning up for those who were on my schedule. It seemed like almost every day someone was on my schedule. Dan didn't seem to notice it, at least he never told me about it. Although we often talked, he typed the words, and I talked to him. I thought he didn't know what I was doing. Looking back, I realized that he certainly should have. It took me three long years to pay my medical bills, and during the same period, I paid off our house. There were only current medical and living expenses. I remember the day the insurance ended, 
another sweet item printed in small print, which went as an addendum and read, for a maximum of five years. Now I've accepted my fate. Tears have long been gone about what I did for a living, or rather, I was numb. It was only with Carl that I allowed myself to relax. With the others I screamed and dodged. I learned how to pretend well. I was able to understand what was pulling my client's chain. She could turn from an outspoken fool into a conservative young lady demanding intricate seduction in a matter of seconds. As I said, I was lucky. I managed to get into the business right away, and thanks to the connections through Carl, I didn't have to deal with appearances and concerns about some of the dangers associated with this craft. Of course, there were a couple of incidents. One person put $200 in $20 bills in an envelope, but a phone call to Carl fixed everything. Yes, it's true. I've never counted the money. It's always been there, except once. Another time. I arrived at the room and was inside before I realized that there were two men there, not one. This client was a referral from one of the other clients. I quickly realized that I might be in trouble, so when they demanded that I undress, I did so. When one held my hair, forcing me to open my mouth, and the other rammed me from behind, I did not resist. There was no envelope, but I got out of there almost unscathed. My phone call to Carl didn't give me anything. They left when the people he sent arrived. I don't know what happened to the person who directed them. I never saw him again. After that, I became much more careful. One day, when I arrived home after meeting with a client, there was a white van outside my house. It was Connie, our home care nurse. We had an alarm installed that Dan could press if he needed help. I rushed inside, worried that something had happened. Connie was examining Dan's right leg, and she looked at me, giving me a disapproving look from head to toe. I realized that she saw my skirt was too short, my cleavage was too big, and my face was too made up, and she understood everything. I must have blushed. What happened? His finger and foot are infected. But how? He can't feel it. It looks like maybe he wrote on the screen that he was in pain. Dan was taken to the hospital, treated, and tested. Somehow, the sensation was returning to his legs. One of his toenails, which I had carelessly trimmed, had grown and become infected. It was just lucky that he regained his sensitivity and noticed it. My life and what I did were for him, but they became my life and what I did for myself. I missed all the signs. Dan finally pressed the button to get outside help to handle what was supposed to be my job. I didn't notice it, immersed in my world of love and money. And then I realized that he knew too. I sat and cried for hours. After Dan returned home, I didn't go out for several weeks. I spent all my time caring for and working with him. Then something else happened. Once I washed him, changed his bottle, he got a little erection, and I took care of it with my hands and mouth. When I looked up, I saw tears in his eyes. A few days later, I talked to Carl, explaining that I was going to try to find a job. Carl offered me a job for him, and my secretarial skills suited his business perfectly. Besides, I don't want to lose you, he added. I knew what that meant, and I realized that my job would probably also include taking care of Carl, meeting his needs. Perhaps my own, of course. The difference was obvious to me. I would make love to one man I liked for money. Or I could make love to a number of men I didn't care about for money. At least, that's what it seemed to me at the time. I accepted this job. I was good at it. And for more than two months Carl never asked or offered to make love. On some days, young women came and went to his office. I was just doing my job, not really missing love. Besides, Carl paid me very well. I was almost satisfied. My own desires took a back seat as my mind was occupied with all the new aspects of a full-time job. One day I was printing a series of sales reports for one of Carl's product lines when he called me. I grabbed my notebook, preparing to write down the letter. You won't need this, he said when I entered his office. What? And then I realized, probably, somewhere in the world of my fantasies, I became Dana, a conservative housewife again. I put down my notebook and took a deep breath. Then I let a smile cover my face, preparing for what I thought would happen next. Please sit down. I need to ask you something. Embarrassed, I sat down. Tonight, three clients are coming to my city. They will stay here for several days. I tried my best not to react. They are Japanese, and they asked for personal entertainment? The last one was a question. I knew what he wanted. They asked you to. Of course. 
I managed to hide a sigh. Carl nodded. Thanks. I'll make it worth your effort. Smiling, I returned to my desk. Japanese gentlemen would probably tip well, I thought. I sat and thought about it. Nothing special. Nothing I haven't done yet. But I knew I didn't want that. I wanted to be at home with my man, living like the sweet conservative housewife I used to be. But I've already calculated that we're behind on the bills again. It's time to go to work. Yes, you can't know what this life is like until you live it like me. I put my head in my hands, but there were no tears. They left me a long time ago. I am Dana, a working girl. I took a step towards it myself, knowing that there is no turning back. Not quite. You can hide. You can pretend. You can move, pick up your husband and try again in another city. The next man I meet will probably remember me. There were thousands of them, and I had nowhere to go. The end result will be the same. No matter what, I will always be who I am. I serve men for money. If you hire me, you are no better than me. In fact, you're just like me. I'm just letting you feel that it's different. So if you do that, you're just John. And me? I'm just a working girl.